U.S.-China relations, which started to deteriorate under Obama and worsened significantly under Trump, has reached an all-time low under Biden. The root cause is the increasing perception by the U.S. that China represents an immense threat to U.S. global economic dominance. Yet this is not the first time that the U.S. has felt this way about another country. Japan became the second largest economy in the world in 1962. By the early 1980s, Japan had the largest trade surplus with the U.S. of any country. By 1985, Japan became America's biggest creditor. By early 1990s, Americans generally considered Japan's economy to be a greater threat than the Soviet Union's military. The job of any government is to protect and improve the lot of its own people. What did Japan do to make Japan great? And what is China doing now? Why is technology so central to both of their drive to the top? What did the U.S. do to stop Japan from challenging its economic hegemony? What are the similarities and differences between U.S.-China relations in the 1980s and 90s and U.S.-China relations today? What will be the result of the tech war between U.S. and China? Is there any silver lining for the world? Hi, I'm David Wu, a former Wall Street strategist with a 20-year track record of making actionable predictions about major global change. Hello, everybody. I'm in Tokyo today at the uh, Palace Hotel in the 19th floor meeting room. You can see up there, that's the Imperial Palace of Japan up there, if you can see it. And I have the greatest honor of being joined today by Scott Foster to talk about Asia, Japan, China, tech, and everything else that I think are really important issues of the day. And Scott is a very special guy. Scott, you know, is an American who lived in Japan for more than 40 years. He finished Stanford. He was an equity analyst for Merrill Lynch in Japan, for Lehman Brothers. He's now a reporter, journalist. He, very few people understand, especially from an American standpoint, Japan, Asia, and Korea, and China as well as Scott. And then he happens to be also a tech analyst. So from that point of view, <laughs> when it comes to the tech war, there's nobody else like Scott. So from that point of view, Scott is going to bring a lot of basically perspectives that I think are important to understanding the world, especially when it comes to the current power struggle between the unipolar world and the multipolar one. So Scott, thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you. Very good to see you here, David. So Scott, tell us a little bit about your background. So, you know, again, you came to Japan 40 years ago. Like, what made you come to Japan? You know, like, how was Japan then? We'll start with my graduate, graduate school experience at SAIS in Washington, D.C., where I studied Japanese politics and international economics. And then I came over here, and the financial markets were just opening up, and I was lucky enough to find a job, uh, first at a consulting firm, and then at Merrill Lynch uh, as an analyst. And I, my Japanese was good enough to get in the door then. Uh, I couldn't do that now with, with the, the knowledge I had then, but I, at that time it was a great opportunity and I took it and I've been here ever since. Wow. So you, went, you got to Japan, what, 1970 when? I, mean, I uh, first came here in 1976, 1976 and I came back from Washington, D.C. in 1982. So tell, talk to us a little bit about Japan back in the days. Obviously, the reason why I'm particularly interested in Japan, I think Japan is particularly interesting at the moment, is because, as we were saying before, you think about like you know U.S. hegemony since the end of the Second World War, right? I mean, obviously, there was a Soviet Union, but Soviet Union never really threatened the U.S., economically speaking. If you think about the countries that really threatened the U.S., at least perceived threatened the U.S. for the last 60 years, there was Japan and there was China. So I'm very interested in understanding what are the differences and similarities between, you know, the U.S.-Japan relationship versus the U.S.-China relationship. But I want us to really start with the 1970s because the late 70s, when you first got to Japan, like that was when the Japanese economy was just about to take off. What was Japan like then? You know? Oh, well, it was uh, still a developing country. Uh, it was a lot poorer than it is now, obviously. Uh, Americans who came here were shocked at what they thought was the poverty. But it had improved massively since 1945, when everything you see out the window here was burnt to the ground. So they totally rebuilt their, their economy. And they had a strong economy in the 1930s, so they weren't working from zero. Uh, and they had a, a, a habit of uh, industrial policy that comes out of their, uh, what, communitarian uh, and what we would call feudal society, cooperative, Everybody helps each other, whole of nation effort. And they also study a lot, 
and they learned a lot from the Americans, a lot of technology, and aimed to build up a complete modern industrial society through hard work and study. And they were halfway there uh, when I arrived. Right. But, but again, you know, a lot of countries believe in hard work and studies, right? But very few countries have gotten to where Japan is. Okay. So what, was it anything that the Japanese did right, you know, that somehow set them apart from everybody else? As an organization, Japan is highly organized from top to bottom, and it's a homogenous, communitarian society. Uh, if you want to get stereotypical about it, it comes out of you know, rice farming. If you don't all work together, you all starve. You work together, you build something. And it's common, of course, to all of East Asia. Um, Japan, the Japanese were on a mission. You know, when the, the Western imperialists showed up in the 19th century, uh, they, they realized very quickly that they were outgunned and outteched, and that if they didn't get their act together, they would become a colony like most of the rest of the world. So they went to work and they built a modern economy and they already had one by the 1930s. Uh, the British taught them how to build railways. And they, they, 20 years later, by 1900, they didn't need British technology or British engineers anymore. And now, of course, they are building railways in the UK. So the intense effort, focused effort, uh, discipline, organization, top-down, uh, and national consensus. And so that's very similar to China. So that, that's the good starting point from the, for the, the economics. But what about like nationalism? Like, for example, did you feel like back then, the 70s, 80s, the Japanese were also motivated by, you know, this kind of desire to prove that Japan can basically play with the best in the world, can basically become one of the best in the world, and so on and so forth? Oh, sure. From the very beginning. Um, but, you know, working on the premise that actually they are the best in the world, they just kind of took their eyes off the ball for a while, which is a similar, similar to how the Chinese think. Uh, I mean, they, they're convinced, you know, of course, that they are the best, but they've fallen behind and they have to get their act together and do their best. And uh, if they do, well, then they'll become first rate. And, right. well, go have a look. They are. Right, right, right. <laughs> No, however, I mean, but, but, you know, obviously we all know, like, you know, you know, at the, deep down when it comes to like why some countries succeed and others don't in terms of playing catch up, right? Because a lot of countries get basically stuck in this, what they call basically the uh, middle income trap, yes. right? They, they grow rapidly for a few years, for a couple of decades, and then all of a sudden the growth rate basically levels off. They never really manage to basically make that final convergence to the rich countries and Japan did. Obviously, there's no question, a very big part of that is about technology, right? Oh, oh yes, oh you know, yes. It's a, because I think the day, you know, like the difference between a rich country, a really rich country, and a not so rich country is basically marginal product of labor, right? You know, and from that point of view, like the more capital you have, the better capital you have, the better technology That's you have, right. you're gonna be more productive, you're gonna earn more money, you're gonna raise your standard of living that way. Now, obviously, you know, back then in the late 70s, or 80s, I still remember like when Japan was basically like, you know, was rising and Japan was viewed as a threat, especially in the US, you know, you know, I remember like, you know, the whole idea of intellectual property rights was one that was obviously very, very often come to the fore as, you know, Japan is copying, Japan is imitating, Japan is violating, you know, IPs. To what extent do you think that was a, a major issue as well, as far as Japan in terms of to what extent what I'm saying is that, you know, basically copying was an important part of the catch-up, basically, uh, process. Copying is key to, the, to learning. Everybody copies in order to learn. And when the, the Europeans first came to Japan, the Japanese responded uh, not by trying to uh, what, deny everything Western. They, they hired hundreds of Western experts to come over here and teach them physics, railroad building, medicine, everything. Uh, and then after the war, uh, they had to start over. Um, before the war, there was a heavy influence of German technology. After the war, it became American technology. And I remember reading that right after the war, uh, with, just on the road here was MacArthur's headquarters. And uh, in there, 
uh, there was a there was a library for Japanese to drop by and visit, and Japanese uh, students and engineers would come by and they they'd read the uh, the journals of uh, well everything from popular mechanics to the journals of. of of electronics industry uh, segments and other sciences and they'd read all that stuff and they'd study it and they studied very very hard and this is something that like, did not happen say in uh, Turkey to pick another country that's actually doing quite well but it's not at the forefront of technology development and the Japanese got in there and they studied so hard that you know they invented NAND flash memory and the tunnel diode and you know they, they won were pretty soon they were winning Nobel prizes in advanced technology and it's extremely important to development here because they internalized they didn't just copy they copied and learned and internalized the uh, the development the technology development process so that Japan is the only non-western country that has a significant number of Nobel prize winners and it's because of this fixation on learning the most advanced technology and applying it here. Right, right, right. Now, obviously, a very big part about the innovation technology development was Japan's industrial policy, right? Yes. Meaning, because industrial policy meaning the government decided, okay, fine, this, these are the areas that we want to basically become great at, and then therefore they basically <laughs> put a lot of money into it. Yep, they said yep. people, right? Exactly. Now, the, <laughs> Japan's industrial policy clearly play a pretty big role in terms of Japan becoming, you know essentially uh, a first world country. And that became a model for a lot of other countries, yeah. especially in East Asia, where there's Korea and Taiwan yeah. and now China. To what extent, you know, this whole industrial policy, because obviously the U.S., you know, now the U.S. is now starting to adopt that industrial policy as we've seen mm -hmm. under basically Biden. But for a long time, U.S. was very, very, you know, sort of farm, you know, basically at industrial policy, thinking that that is anti-competitive and so on and so forth. So. How do you talk to us about basic industrial policy? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? How does it work? Well, I just have to say, they picked winners and they won. <laughs> we'll start there. Um, so industrial policy is, is uh, it's a big debate, right? And economists and philosophers debate this, but the fact is industrial policy is very good if you have a target. It's very good if you're playing catch up. If you're leading the world and there's, and there's you know, there was almost no competition from the Industrial Revolution in, in Britain through uh, the United States 30 years ago, except from the Germans. Um, they were leading the pack and they were inventing everything. So if you got a bunch of politicians like trying to pick winners, uh, and you can see this happening right now with the Biden administration interfering in tech, they don't know what they're doing. They're not smart enough or sorry, they're not experienced enough to, to make the proper choices. Uh, however, if you're playing catch up, it's a lot easier. And then you just need organization and discipline and you need to put the money where the money is needed. And it, that was not all of it in Japan. There's, there's a, also a very strong uh, stream of entrepreneurialism in Japan. Uh, independent entrepreneurs that when the industrial policy was wrong, they would just tell the government, you're wrong. And furthermore, uh, I see all this democracy the Americans forced on us. Well, under these rules, you can't tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I want. And the most famous of, example of that is Honda. And the Japanese government was trying to merge Honda into another company because it thought there were too many automakers and that Honda wasn't necessary. And Mr. Honda just told him to take a flying leap. And he used to wear pink suits. And he'd go to meetings, his hands are, are black with oil, and he's wearing a pink suit, and uh, he just told him to take a hike. And today we have Honda, and you know, it, among other things, it just passed Cessna to be number one in business jets. So anyway, uh, there's that other stream, uh, entrepreneurial stream, very aggressive and talented entrepreneurs. Right. So talented entrepreneurs and industrial policy, but the most important thing is that the people who are actually at the very top who are deciding on which industries to basically target, they actually seem to know what they were doing. Yes, because they're professionals. They're like the Ministry of, uh, used to be the Internet Ministry of uh, International Trade and Industry. It's the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry now, MITI. Uh, maybe you heard of the book MITI and the Japanese Miracle. Yeah. Um, overstated from some points of view, but actually quite crucial. And it still exists. And anytime there's a, a leading edge uh, technology, like say 3D semiconductor packaging, IC packaging, 
Behind that, you will find government, high tech, and science bureaucracies that have planned this and coordinated the, the uh, cooperation of, of somewhere between five and 20 Japanese firms that specialize in that technology. Yeah. yeah. No, that, that's very interesting because obviously, you know, there's no doubt, like, you know, we tend to think that you're either a centralized, you know, basically economy or you're completely, basically deregulated and decentralized. In the case of Japan, you know, entrepreneurship, which is obviously a product of decentralization and centralized, you know, yes. state planning in the form of the industrial organization, that combination proved to be a winning recipe for Japan. Yes, and, and I think one thing we need to add here is uh, due to uh, the way it's organized, it's, it's sort of a consensus system where the, the government and the business organizations and the companies, they have a consensus view of what needs to be done in Japan. You know, it worked out through like extensive debate and experiment. And one thing they did not uh, do, I, was, I wanted to use the word allow, but that's not quite right because it wasn't like they wanted to do it, but they weren't allowed to do it. They watched the U U.S. outsource its manufacturing, and they thought, no, 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 no way. That is, that is not what we're going to do, and they didn't do it. And I got all kinds of flack as a tech analyst in Japan, you know, 20 years ago. I mean, New York guys would say, like, you know, when's, when's Sony going to close all their factories and outsource everything? I mean, that's the wave of the future. And I said, never going to happen. And they say, well, then we just write off the Japanese stock market. They have no future. Okay, well, now today, the Americans are flailing around trying to get Asians to build semiconductor factories in America. Well, there you have it. Yeah. <laughs> so how would you, so obviously after Japan, you know, in terms of experiment with, you know, with uh, industrial policy and got Japan very rich, you know, I think the next country in Asia that tried to basically hit, jump on the same bandwagon was, of course, Korea. Yes. Would you say that how was I mean? Would you say what Koreans did was no different than what just continuation of what the Japanese did that created the likes of Samsung? And you can also argue like Samsung today is even more successful than Sony. You know, do you think that have the Koreans done something right? You know, what what did they do differently to the Japanese? By the way, well, first Korea was a, a Japanese colony, and so there was a like there was a, there was and there still is a very strong feeling like we are going to catch up with you and beat you at your own game but it's the same game yeah. now there are differences uh, and i suppose the biggest one is that the korean economy is, is a lot smaller and the base is, is narrow because of the size japan has thousands of small and medium sized enterprises that are pretty high tech korea does not but it's getting more and more and more. They're following the same pattern with a, you know, a different uh, resource base. And Taiwan also, and then China. So what the Chinese are doing, whether they admit it or not, derives directly from what the Japanese did to build their economy in the face of Western imperialism and then rebuild it after World War II. And you mentioned, but I didn't answer, about the uh, IP theft. Uh, borrowing of technology and uh, copying being part of the learning experience. Well, the Americans got very annoyed, particularly when the Japanese became the top semiconductor producer in the world. That was 1995. But even before then, they were really annoyed about Japanese copying their technology. Um, there were lawsuits, tariffs were imposed, market rigging, market share, sharing uh, agreements were reached. None of it worked. And one of the reasons it didn't work was because all along the Pentagon was saying, look, the top priority is we have to have those bases, which is Yokosuka and the other American bases in Japan. So the economic policy was always overruled by military and geopolitical considerations, which, of course, that applies exactly in the exactly reverse way to China. But what I'm trying to understand is why was it so difficult to enforce, you know, basically intellectual property? What, to what extent? Because I remember this, because this issue, I mean, it seems so black and white. I mean, to the extent that yeah, yeah, you violate, a... we're going to basically sue you, and the international courts are going to be, you know, what I'm saying is like, what, what I don't understand is, I mean, I guess, you know, like, because the issue now, the issue, the issue has come to the fore in the case of China, at least over the last five years, it was for a long time 
an issue that the U.S. has with Japan and then Korea and so on and so forth. Like, why why is it so difficult to basically address the whole IP basically issue? I mean, I think because the the supply chains uh, are so intertwined uh, that there's a lot of companies in the U.S. have a strong interest in sourcing from China because it's cheap and they also sell a lot in China so they don't want the relationship to be broken. Um, that's one, one part of it. Another part of it is the United States, especially now, back then they had a more dominant position but today they do not dominate the markets. The, the Chinese can sell in China and outside the U.S. and still build huge economies of scale. Now 30 years ago that was not possible. If you couldn't sell in America you could not become a world leader, but now you can. So the, the situation has changed. Uh, and we're, we're seeing this with uh, a lot of pushback against the, the Biden policies from the American side. Uh, and just to take a, a, a small example, I, I, I know a fellow who has a, a company uh, in the States. He imports uh, small mechanical parts from China. And he said, even after Trump's tariffs, it's far cheaper to import from China. So he could, in theory, he could buy from America. Practically, he probably couldn't because there probably isn't an American maker of these parts, but he could buy them from other countries and double his cost base. Is he going to do that? Not if he doesn't have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting. But my, my point here is that, you know what, you know, like, because you tend to think, right, in the case of, in the case of China, right, I mean, of all these countries in the end, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to understand is that why is it so difficult for these countries to pay for intellectual property? I mean, is that question of like what I'm what I'm trying to say is like let's say you want to learn, if you want to basically learn how to make something, right? You could either basically like copy it, yep. reverse engineer it, and basically do your own thing, or you basically pay for it, and once you pay for it, you can also <laughs> learn how to basically make it. Why is it so difficult for these countries to actually pay for, it? or that you cannot pay for it and start producing it? What I'm saying is that is there sort of is it one of these things that if if, if you basically accept that there's such a thing as intellectual property, then you, you will never try to reverse engineer and try to copy it. And therefore, you'll never actually learn how to basically make it. So that therefore, if you want to be good at something, if you want to be rich, you want to be good in technology. That almost by definition, you have to be prepared to basically violate IP. That's what I'm trying to basically get at. Is it one of these things? Is that black and white? Was there something else that I'm missing? Oh, oh, it's a very good question because uh, you know, frequently here, you know, the Chinese, they stole all our technology. Well, they also bought a lot. I'm trying to remember the number. It's like $200 million they spent on American IP. Uh, so when the Chinese do it, like if they steal our IP, we say, you stole our IP. If they buy the IP, we say, no one should be allowed to sell IP to China. Yeah. Okay, they lose either way. Wait, basically, we don't want China around. You know, China free, Indo-Pacific. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, um, but it, it's it's difficult, you know. Any company will go right up to the limit in uh, borrowing technology, right? I mean, there there are patent lawsuits between American companies all the time, right? Especially in tech, they're always suing each other. You know, how far did you go? And then they reach an agreement, and the loser has to pay royalties. Uh, but if it was a clear cut situation to begin with, usually they buy the technology. Um, the the Chinese. Uh, for historical reasons and also political reasons, uh, they have been egregious borrowers of technology and gone, you know, way past what the U.S. is prepared to tolerate. Now the Japanese did too, but they were an ally in the Cold War, and so the Pentagon said, like, lay off. And but the Japanese learned that they have not, unlike the Chinese, they have not alienated the cooperative relationship between their country and the U.S. and Europe. So if you look at the tech industry, you'll see that the, the companies in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, the U.S., Canada, and Europe, they, and elsewhere inside the, the, the Western capitalist system, they are both competitors and they cooperate with each other. And in tech, probably the best example of this is IMEC, you know, the uh, semiconductor and nano research facility in Belgium, where you know Tokyo Electron is active there, the Americans are all active there, anybody in the semiconductor industry with leading edge technology works with IMEC. It's in Belgium. Um, the Chinese can't. They alienated themselves from this uh, international cooperative regime by like, borrowing too much technology without paying for it. 
and nobody wants him around to borrow more without paying for it. And then on top of that, the Americans are after him uh, you know, for, for military and political reasons, so they, they're out uh, of this system. Now, they're, Western companies still work, want to work with them, so they're not completely excluded, but they've done themselves a great disservice by overdoing it. Yeah, you know, that, that's, a, that's, that's one of these things that I, I, I find very interesting, which is that was it simply bad policies on the part of China, right? Because we all know, like, for example, like, I don't even know what's happening now, but we all know, like, you know, literally, like, 98% of Windows software in China is basically pirated, mm -hmm. or whatever, like, Microsoft yeah. offices yeah. pirated. You know, we know that there's no Google in China. There is no whatever, you know, YouTube in China. And because they, in many ways, have encouraged their own, yes. you know, basically um, Google lookalike, you know, YouTube lookalike, and so on and so forth. So from that point of view, they've been very product protective of their industries. Now, for a long time, they were able to get away with it because it was not as though Microsoft decided to get out altogether, right? right. So from that point of view, I think it's also true that because China was big, therefore, they thought that they could basically, you know, play hardball with everybody else. You know, like, for example, the whole requirement for technology transfer, you want to come basically get this contract in China to build this high speed, basically a net I mean, tr train, because it's going to be hundreds, hundreds of billions of dollars, you got to basically, basically, you're required to transfer some technology. But do you think that's what what happened in China was it just bad policy? Was that because China was so big, they thought they had so much leverage that they could get away with it. So therefore, they went down this path, which has proved to be very costly at this point? Um, both. Uh, you know, it's very hard to prove, but my, my, my conclusion is, from analyzing the situation, is that the Chinese politicians did not understand the importance of the semiconductor industry. And, you know, in any other industry, you know, they're doing fine. You know, in fact, they, they're maybe sweeping the board. But they failed to realize how complicated and difficult and how high the barriers uh, of entry are to the semiconductor industry and set themselves up for this sanctions regime. I don't think that the people at the top of the Communist Party understood that issue. And that's just my conclusion from watching how it developed because they're, they're much more careful in, in other areas. Uh, this was an oversight based on, well, their, their background. Um, on the other hand, well, what do we have? Uh, the, the, the Japanese, you know, did the same thing. One of the one of the things about China that resembles Japan a long time ago is that the Chinese want to do it all. They want every industry in China. And the NEC, which in 1995 was the world's largest maker of semiconductors, and which today barely makes semiconductors, uh, at that time they had an advertisement that said, just imagine any electronic product you want, anything, you know, from, from a hair dryer to uh, a, a satellite in space. You can buy it all from NEC. So jack of all trades, master of none. That was their, their goal, was to totally like, build a, like, a national industry and be done with those foreigners. Uh, of course, it, it's not efficient. <laughs> it doesn't work. Uh, and the, the Chinese kind of have this idea, but at the same time, of course, they, they bring in a lot of foreign technology. And their idea was to maximize uh, the Chinese control or knowledge and understanding of technology and ability to manufacture while also making it, uh, what, making foreign companies have a, uh, an interest in the development of China. And they've been quite successful, uh, especially with the Europeans, in doing that. Um, so it's a mixture of all these things. It's not, it's not a clearly defined thing like they made policy mistakes or you know, they didn't want to pay for technology. It's, it's a mishmash of all these things. Yeah. But certainly when it comes to semiconductors, they were willing to pay, right? I mean, they were willing to basically buy semiconductors from the rest of the world. They were willing to basically pay for a semiconductor manufacturing machine from the rest of the world, right? I mean, that was one area, as you said. I mean, they didn't try to copy. They didn't even try to basically manufacture themselves. Well, at least not yet anyway. Not in a big way. Well, they, they couldn't. They, they did what they could, but they were way behind the curve, and it was very, very difficult. And so they bought. I mean, they're a huge customer. So we're in the unique situation of, you know, if, if, if we cut off, totally cut off, you know, sales of semiconductors to China, it will, it will push Silicon Valley to the wall. <laughs> you know, this is great. You know, they, they, you know, 
customer is king, right? So shoot the customer in the head. Yeah. You know, what, that's, what kind of policy is that? It, there's got to be some subtlety here. And they're, actually, they're trying to do it with the, you know, we're only targeting defense. But it's, it's not, yeah. not true. But they, they, they're trying to like, have a, a more subtle policy, but it's quite awkward. Yeah. I think there's no doubt. I mean, in my mind, I think China was trying to basically, I mean, like, you know, again, I think, I, I don't know, like, you know, countries do things. Obviously, we have to assume that every country is going to do whatever it takes to better its own interest, right? Well, I mean, as so, it sees that interest, As it right? sees that interest. Whether it's exactly. mistaken or not. Exactly, exactly. So th it's not about right or wrong, I yeah. think, you know. And I think from China's standpoint, because it's big, because it consumes, what, 30% of the world's production of semiconductors, Therefore, that gives you tremendous, basically, market power. I mean, to the extent that yes. you think that, you know what, you could literally get everything on the cheap. It's just like, basically, like right now in the U.S., they're trying to basically uh, get all the uh, hospitals to get all the, basically, you know, I mean, if, the good thing about national, having a national health care as opposed to a lot of private providers, yes. is that a national health care system can basically buy all the drugs, you know, as one single entity, yes, yes, therefore yes, you yes, have yes. more... Pricing exactly. power. Yes. In the case of China, because they're so big, they they've been trying to exploit yes. their size. Of course. You know, and, and obviously the rest of the world is not too happy about it. And the difference between Japan and China, Japan's got hundred million people, China's got one point four billion people. Exactly. And so from that point of view, China in terms of the economies of scale, right, is basically ten times the size of Japan. Exactly. And this is why China can basically play this kind of hardball that's ten times more aggressively than the Japanese. Yeah. And still be able to get away with it, at least until now. Right. Yeah, yeah, and so we can. That's exactly right. And so we can say it's like they, they kind of overdid it, overdid. and so now they have to deal with this friction that that has erupted. Yeah, because also at this point, China doesn't just threaten the U.S. It threatens, you know, Japan, South Korea, everybody else, right? Yeah. I'm just looking about the cars. I mean, the, the auto industry, right? I mean, because yeah. Japan has been on the decline now for yeah. many years. The right. Japanese economy and China has been basically going the other way. And then, you know, the sort of the last bastion of Japanese, basically, <laughs> industry is the auto industry. Oh, yes, oh, yes. And then, you know, <laughs> China is now basically at least the world in, in electric vehicles, right? You yeah. know, so from that point of view, like I can imagine that the, the Japanese are looking at the Chinese are probably petrified. Um, they're quite concerned and they're, they're doing something about it. The, the, the Japanese, the presence of the Japanese auto industry in China is very large. And it's it's approaching the size of the Japanese industry in you know, auto industry in the U.S. It's not that they're ignoring China, but they see they see the you know, ten thousand dollar car, I mean, a ten thousand dollar electric vehicle. Where else can you buy one? Like nowhere, right? This this cost differential and the pricing difference, the pricing advantage that the Chinese manufacturing industry has, is is enough to scare anybody. And so they're, they're trying to become part of the industry. Yeah. And anyway, that's a, another yeah, no, I think that's, detailed it, subject. It's actually very interesting. If you, you look at most other countries, I mean, you think about like the success of the East Asian experiment, right? They tend to be small countries. Right. Like, you know, Singapore is small, Hong Kong is small, like even South Korea and Taiwan are not that big. So, you know, if you, when you have these countries that are reasonably small and have relatively homogenous population yes. with Confucian basically like yes. tradition yes. and emphasis on learning, hard work, that kind of thing, you can make it, right? right? And we never had a situation like in China, like a 1.4 billion people with, with everything that these small basic countries have, but also have the advantage of size. Obviously, China is now viewed as a major threat, mm. you know, at least in the U.S. But let's go back a little bit to the 70s and the 80s, mm. when, when the Americans view Japan as the rising threat. What did the Americans do back then? I mean, you know, maybe talk us through a little bit about what you saw. Okay, well, um, first they denied it was happening. And any number of economists wrote that the East Asian model is just wrong. You know, they don't understand economics. <laughs> they, they've um, changed their views um, since then. Uh, anyway, they responded with tariffs, anti-dumping tariffs, and then uh, you know, market sharing agreements, uh, political pressure, criticism, um, you know, smashing up Toshiba laptops on the steps of the Capitol. Uh, uh, and then what happened was, you know, Japan, like the U.S., you know, in the, in the 50s, I mean, the U.S. was 
it did the same thing as, as Japan and China. It was growing at 10% a year, year after year after year after year, after, after, in the 1950s. It just grew and grew and grew. And, and then, of course, you know, law, law of large numbers, the growth rate started to level off. And then other factors emerged. Same in Japan, grew for a decade at 10% a year, up, 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 and then reached its limit. Uh, the same thing is happening in China right now, right? It, you, you can't go from, you know, a $2 a day economy to a $10,000 <laughs> economy, you know, uh, and, and then have the growth rate stay on a straight line. It just doesn't happen. It's starting to level off. And what happened when the case of Japan was Japan way overdid it. They had their gigantic uh, speculative uh, financial and asset boom, real estate asset boom in the 80s. It went to the point where, you know, a square meter in Ginza was worth more than the United States on paper, and then the whole thing exploded and collapsed. And meanwhile, the U.S. was going into the boom years of the, of the 90s, and the tech was going crazy, and they invented all this new stuff that the Japanese couldn't manage to copy, uh, and they forgot about Japan. They decided Japan was irrelevant. Uh, and for 20 years now, they're, they've been saying the same thing's gonna happen to China. Well, we don't know if it'll happen or not, but we do know that 10% annual economic growth is not possible in China anymore. And in fact, they can quite easily go sideways, you know, for a long time. Now, it's still a gigantic economy. Um, I don't think it means that everyone else gets poorer. Uh, so th they're leading in, in electric vehicles. Great. <laughs> that will take pressure off oil prices and the environment and also make cars affordable to a lot more people, several times more people. Uh, so it, it's not like a uh, win-lose for the world. It might have a serious negative repercussions for the United States and in terms of relative economic power. If the United States uh, what, excludes itself from the China market, which seems to be the policy right now. Right. I mean, I mean I, when, I, when I look back at the 70s and 80s, I think the most significant development as far yeah. as the Japanese economy that ultimately did it in, of course, was that under pressure from the US, the Japanese yen, okay, yes. just went through the roof. Right. I mean, in other words, the currency appreciated dramatically in both nominal and in real terms. Yes, yes. And as the currency was, you know, as, again, under the pressure from the U.S., the, you know, the yen appreciated so much that the Bank of Japan had no other choice but to keep lowering interest rates to slow down the ascent of the yen. And yeah. it was the very, very low interest rates that sparked the real estate bubble, the stock market bubble, and so on and so forth. And when that bubble became... Too great, it burst, and that was the end. <laughs> yeah. So, in some sense, I think the Chinese have always been very, very sort of like you know cognizant yes. that this could happen to us. And yes. This is why, for a long time, they resisted allowing the currency to appreciate rapidly as was demanded from the U.S. And then, you know, for a long time, they were able to get away with that. But do you think that is true? Like, you know, in some sense, that the yen's appreciation ultimately became sort of like you know. You know what, what brought down the house? You know, partly. You know the 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 Plaza Accord, 1985. Uh, initially, it doubled the value of the yen, and the Americans thought, "Ha, we solved the problem. We doubled the value of their currency. Their artificial export surplus is going to vanish. Their so-called competitiveness will be revealed for what it really isn't, and we're fine." But it didn't happen. Uh, the Japanese went to work and they adapted to the situation and they, they've run a trade surplus with the U.S. every year since then. Every single year. And, and how do you explain the fact, because obviously what was true about Japan then is now also true about China, which is like, you know, the army went up and the U.S. is still running a basically a massive trade deficit with China, right? Yep. Just yep. like, you know, Japan is still running a trade surplus with, with the U.S. So the question really is like, you know, what is it about, I mean, do you think it's about, it's, it's specific about China and Japan or something about the U.S. that actually, that the structural trade relations between those countries, you know, always basically work against the U.S. in the sense that U.S. has continued to run a basically deficit, whether it is with Japan or with China for that matter. What is it about the U.S.? Well, if you, if you, if you are running a global currency, if you're the reserve currency for the world and you have a license to print money, you have the what extravagant advantage or what, whatever the French called it, 
where you don't have to actually work and make things and sell them. You can just print money and everyone else will accept this money. You have this advantage, but it probably overvalues your currency and damages your export competitiveness. Um, but at the same time, you can't really isolate that factor because the, the East Asian economies are highly disciplined, focused on manufacturing, and at least at the beginning, they had lower cost bases. So they put all their energy into an area where the U.S. was at a structural disadvantage. And that re resulted in huge imbalances. Uh, and then like one more comment here is that uh, if you look at China's trade and America's trade, Japan's trade, the country that's out of step is the United States. Nobody else has gigantic trade deficits with China. Only the U.S. has a giant trade deficit with China. And that's structural and it has to do with the U.S. And of course China's taking maximum advantage of it, just like the Japanese did, and anyone would. Uh, but it does not originate from like a devious sneaky calculations in, you know, in the forbidden city. <laughs> it, it emerges from the structure of the world economy with the dollar playing a dominant reserve currency role and also you know, American economic policy right. and, and, and the willingness of American corporations to outsource to other countries. So um, Biden's trying to reverse this, right? He's, his people and other people in America have figured, figured this out, what the dynamics are. And now, now they've got a, a, a problem of trying to implement effective industrial policy to what, rebuild American manufacturing, keep the jobs at home, but at the same time not lose the advantages of the U.S. dollar. Right. No, I think, that, I, think that, that, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think that would be very interesting to see if that different approach succeeds, right? Because in some sense, what you could argue what's unique about the U.S., I mean, other than the fact, of course, I mean, it's an issue of reserve currency, can print money, this and this and that. And there's no doubt, I mean, for that reason, I think there's no question that almost by definition, any currency that aims to replace the U.S. dollar, you know, as the world's reserve currency has to accept a dramatic appreciation of that currency, which also makes it so much less attractive for any country that wants to basically replace the dollar's hegemony, right? I mean, I think including China. Now, the, however, the question is, because it seems to me also, you know, when we're talking about the U.S. system, we're also talking about the big multinational corporations, yes. which are sort of the bedrock of the U.S. economic system, right? Yeah. These companies, all they really care about is making money, yeah. right? And they don't really care, oh, wow, you know, whether they're going to be buying from, Amer I mean, basically making stuff in America, okay, or basically buying something from China. All they care about is which, which is going to basically be cheaper and then which is going to basically allow me to make more money. Yeah. Would you say, so from that point of view, in some sense, is the U.S. basically, you know, multinational corporate system that emphasizes it on profitability, that almost by definition pushes America into becoming an importer, a large importer, you know, and then, you know, and, and, and that's why the U.S. ends up basically running large, you know, trade deficit, whichever country that can make basically things the cheapest that will basically give the most room for profitability for U.S. companies. Oh, I think there's something to that, and then there's also, uh, <laughs> of course, that's a, that's the premise of the of the argument coming out of uh, uh, right wing politicians or hostile politicians in a, in Washington that say, you know, like Apple is committing treason by making stuff in China. You know, that, um, but it's not again like you mentioned before. You know, these are not black and white issues. It's not one thing or the other. Uh, Intel's manufactures in America. It's quite profitable. Uh, there are other companies, I mean, great companies that, that manufacture in America. I mean, look what, look what happened during COVID with the vaccines. I mean, we, we saw on TV the, the pharmaceutical factories, the vaccine factories. I mean, absolutely first rate in the United States. They can do it if they want. It's just a, a matter of, uh, of what makes most sense for each corporation. And they're not necessarily like, like bound to like export our industrial base. And this all changes all the time, right? With, with uh, AI and big data, uh, software, and then the advance of robotics and manufacturing technology. Uh, it probably makes the US, if they put their minds to it, more and more competitive because there's less and less of a labor component and less of a, less of a price advantage but, uh, for China and others. But that's happening in China too. 
And people thought that you know, China is, is now like, finished as a major, as the workshop of the world because uh, all the hand assembly work is moving to Southeast Asia. Yeah, well, all the robot assembly work is, is growing in China faster than anywhere else. So this is a highly competitive situation. And for the United States, I mean, the advance of, of factory automation is, is, a, is a strong positive. Um, but they're not the only ones doing it. In fact, they're not even leading it. The robots are made here, the best ones, in Japan. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I, I think what I'm trying to basically get at is that in many ways, like, you know, the, the situation today is very much the result of simply, you know, all these basically different parties were describing within the whole global trading system, whether it's the government, corporations, so on and so forth, actually acting in their own best interest. Yes, yes. And that creates a certain outcome, which we said is not sustainable, and we want to change it. But to change it, we have to change the system. And that, this is, that may not necessarily be a good thing, because at the end of the day, you know, you, we don't know right. whether changing it is going to produce, you know, basically it's changing it, you know, because at the end of the day, we know it's not a zero-sum game. You know? right, right. Yeah. And then in many ways, by changing it, it seems to me that we're now basically trying to basically turn it into a zero-sum game. And that could potentially be a very dangerous thing. You oh, know? Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, for example, like Apple will be a great example, right? I mean, Apple stock basically hit an all-time high last night again, you know, right? This is a company that manufactures in China and it basically sells to all over the world. But it also makes money basically selling phones in China, right? I mean, I think, yeah, you know... A lot of money. You know, a lot of money, right? I mean, I think <laughs> Apple now sells more phones in China than any other country outside the U.S., right? Yeah. So from that point of view, Apple is a good example. It's done very well because precisely, you know, it's basically operates in both U.S., China, and stuff to all over the world. Now, what, you know, the question is, like, you know, if Apple is forced to get out of China, I mean, that presumably is going to come at the expense of the profitability of Apple. It will come at the expense of the price is, is able to basically sell to the rest of the world. And therefore, to the extent that Apple is a major taxpayer in the U.S. and not the largest, that could be a problem. Yeah. And then to the extent that Apple stock is the most widely owned stock in the world. Foreigners are one of basically five dollars to buy basically Apple stocks. Yes, that could basically be bad news for the U.S. dollar as well. So basically, what I'm, what worries me right now is that by changing a little part of this whole entire system, it could right. actually unleash a lot of unintended consequences. Yeah, like the collapse of your investment in Apple and the collapse of the U.S. stock market. <laughs> you know, this is this is really serious, right? Uh, the uh, um, it's easy to say this. Uh, it's why is it not happening? I mean, the, the power uh, influence of the corporations is is very great, uh, and so far the the politicians haven't tried to go this far. Uh, but as you say, the, the risk remains. Yeah. But the point, we, 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 but I think what we, we've established so far is yeah. that in many ways, like what China has been up to the last twenty years, is not that different than what the Japanese did, what the Koreans did, what the Taiwanese did. In some sense, it's a continuation yes. of the same, basically, you know, economic model right. that combines hard work, studies, and, um, and industrial policy yes. to play catch-up. Right? Right. And, and we know it's not necessarily a guarantee for, you know, basically, um, for, uh, for, for, high, for very, very high income, but, you know, it, but it's, it's the right... But, but so far, it has already placed, you know, you know, forget about Japan. I mean, Taiwan right now, you know, enjoys a higher standard of living than, you know, at this point in France and Germany, even for that matter, on a purchasing power parity basis. Korea is now right, one right, of the right. top, whatever, 12 biggest economies in the world and so on and so forth. So it's no surprise that China has, is trying to do exactly the same, right? Yeah, you know, exactly. Do the right thing. Now, the question, however, now is that obviously the situation has come to a blow. Right, because yeah. we said before, like let's just say the U.S. could tolerate Japan, because right. you know at the end of the day it's a hundred million population yeah. island country that's far away. Another thing is China, one point four, basically billion people, is clearly a much bigger threat. It is also a threat politically, militarily, right. and so on and so forth. I mean, so from that point of view, like if you look at U.S. policy towards China right now. Do you think that it's just going to get worse and worse and worse? Would you say that, you know, that, you know, we've now basically, you know, sort of like in a basically a place of no return? 
I mean, especially given that China has become a bipartisan issue in the U.S., it doesn't seem to matter anymore whether it's going to be a Democrat or Republican that's going to be in charge. Would you say that this, this, the, the power struggle, goal, whatever you call a strategic competition, this is going to be here to stay, it's going to define, you know, basically the next 10 years or even beyond? Well, that I think is true. But whether or not it will lead to your previously expressed concern that, you know, we're pulling the, the little sticks out of the pile and it's going to collapse and everyone is going to suffer uh, as what comparative advantage is just put to the side and, and everybody loses. Whether we'll get to that is a completely separate issue. And uh, you, you pointed out to me uh, yesterday that article in the Wall Street Journal uh, that, that says that the U.S. is going to not come down so hard on the Koreans and the Taiwanese with regard to their manufacturing of semiconductors in China. And probably that's because there's pushback from the Koreans and the Taiwanese saying you're asking for too much. And there's a, a power balance that's being found where the U.S. can push, but it, it's not, an, not pushing against an open door anymore. There's pushback. And there will be a balance found somewhere uh, that, with any luck at all, will prevent your catastrophic scenario uh, from becoming reality. So what is the sort of like, you know, if you think about like a sort of like a reasonable scenario playing out in the next basically year to two years, what, would, what do you think is the most likely sort of path in terms of U.S. trying? Because, I mean, it seems to me, as we said in the very outset, it's about technology, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, whoever owns technology basically becomes rich and famous, so to speak, right? I mean, that that's what is so... U.S. has always been, you know, sort of at the forefront of innovation. That presumably is why, you know, U.S., you know, if you look at the stock market capitalization of the U.S., right, I mean, it's 50% it's of, uh, of the global market cap, even though the U.S. economy today is only about 20% of the right, world GDP, exactly. right? right? So market cap, to a great extent, is about profitability, which is about the ability to fend off competition, is about yes. the ability to innovate, and so on and so forth, right? So technology, the U.S. understand technology is the bedrock of a success. And then China is now trying to compete and basically, you know, take away. We know, you know, there are a lot of basically reports that came out over the last couple of years suggesting that, US, that China is now tied in first place with the U.S. and quantum computing and AI and 5G and whatnot and so on and so forth. The question now is, imagine, I mean, like, let's just say, like, you know, the U.S. out towards China right now is trying to throw it out throw China's ambition or ability to catch up in the U.S. technologically speaking, what do you think is going to be the sort of the next step? What do you think that we've already seen basically the worst? Well, I was, I was just uh, thinking uh, a couple days ago that actually this, is, this hyper competition is very good for technological advance. Yes. Nobody's taking it easy anymore. Everybody's got the pedal to the metal doing whatever they can. Uh, first with regard to the U.S., okay, NVIDIA, <laughs> Apple. Tesla. <laughs> you know, uh, Tim Cook and, and Elon Musk are heroes in China for a reason, right? Like Nobody over there can match them. Can anyone in China match NVIDIA? Well, not now. I mean, these guys are formidable. And they're not alone either. I mean, the American new technology development machine is, is, is remarkable. And there's no sign of it uh, you know, ceasing to function. Uh, you know, certain companies might have problems, but the system doesn't have a big problem. Um, at the same time, uh, the, uh, the tech war, the onslaught from the U.S., the attempt of the, uh, of the U.S. to stifle Chinese technological development might, well, it has been, you know, successful on a short-term point of view, like Huawei's uh, cell phone business, for example. But on a 10-year view, it will just cause China to advance faster than it otherwise would. I mean, most, most of Chinese uh, big projects, uh, like the, the city near Beijing where they're trying to import, uh, implement uh, uh, electric vehicles or automated driving uh, in a whole system, you know, not, not insert a driverless car into, into a traffic jam in, in California, but to have the whole thing run uh, by computers. Uh, this was originally like a, a big market for companies like Microsoft. Well, it probably isn't anymore. The, the Chinese will now do anything they can to reduce dependence on the U.S. And the, that gigantic semiconductor market you mentioned is an import substitution opportunity of which they will take maximum advantage. 
But the maximum advantage now is in the legacy, or so-called legacy, semiconductors, you know, the older generations, not at the leading edge. So that's where they're focusing their efforts. But there's science, you know, the space science, computer science, is highly advanced. And so they're doing both. I mean, the, at, the, at the leading edge, they've got the science, and at the, in the manufacturing, they've got the mass market. So the, they're not going away. This pressure is going to remain, and the competition will continue. Um, but U.S. technological leadership, uh, it's, it's live and well. Yeah. I think this, this, this actually gets to the crux of the matter, right? <laughs> you know, as you said, you know, like, U.S., there's no question, you know, as the reason why U.S. has managed to stay at the top for so long is because of its ability to innovate, right? I mean, it doesn't really matter whether they teach something, whether they don't teach anything in high school and so on and so forth. So far, it hasn't affected yeah. the ability of the U.S. to <laughs> innovate, right. right? So yeah. I think from that point of view, whether it's because it's, you know, it's willingness to basically, you know, bring in, you know, talent that it doesn't have, or is it because the unlimited, basically, budget it throws at basically, you know, the whole tech, you know, you know, basic ecosystem in Silicon Valley, whatever the U.S. does right, or basically even protecting IP, which basically, you know, essentially raises or actually keep very high the, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the return on investment yes. on basically yeah. on innovation. The U.S. clearly has got the system right. No country has been able. If you think about it, even Europe is like there's not a single tech name I can think of like that carries a European name other than SAP. If you think about this, right? You know, so from that point of view, even Europe has not been able to really compete with the U.S. when it comes to technology. Right. Now That's we right. just said, however, by you know China has been playing catch up rapidly. Okay, because by doing the Japanese system, the question is, it's in ten years' time. Who do you think is going to win? Because this is actually not a comp this is actually, I mean, I, th I think this is a trick question because if you look at Japan, Japan was once, you know, at the forefront of innovation. Japan is clearly has fallen back, right? I mean, today it's like, wow, well, Japanese, you know, they are leaders in certain niches, but they're no longer, let's say, you know, I mean, if you think about Apple has, you know, in many ways, like Sony, right, like yeah. 30 years ago, yeah, yeah. Apple today, right? right, right. But Sony <laughs> right, exactly. still makes very good cameras, but you know what? In, it's not the forefront, okay? So the question really is the whole industrial, you know, basically policy, right? You know, also basically in some sense is not that flexible. Perhaps that's what's telling you that basically, you know, that, you know, the U.S. system, which is about total competition and so on and so forth. I don't know if that's the right way of thinking about this. Mm. But the question is if Japan has fallen behind, okay, in the tech race, do you think it has something to do with Japanese? What do you think has to do with the industrial policy system? Or is it something that's going to happen to China too? Are there any similarities there at all? Uh, in Japan, you no. Know, there are things that Japanese do extremely well. Uh, they haven't fallen behind in robotics. They're leading the world in robotics. Sure. They haven't fallen behind in uh, industrial materials, chemicals for, for the semiconductor industry, for example. You know, they're leading the world in these products. These are things they're very, very good at. What, let's look at software. Well, the U.S. is totally dominant in business software and you know, big data, that kind of thing. But the Japanese totally dominate game software, Nintendo. Um, it's a, a matter of national expertise. You know, the, the Germans are very good at, at making things and they're good at chemicals. They're not very good at uh, uh, what stuff like Amazon or, or NVIDIA. Uh, not good at that at all, but they have semiconductor companies, very good ones, Infineon, ST Micro. Um, there are different countries have different expertise. And I, I think a lot of this is, is cultural and historical. You know, they build an expertise and then they just keep doing it. Uh, and, and the Japanese, like, they really fell behind uh, in manufacturing of commodity semiconductors, memory, uh, and also uh, processors. So like the leading Japanese technology here is like, what, 12 nanometer? You know, TSMC is working on two. Intel's struggling with five. Uh, they're way behind there, and that's why they brought in American technology to build a new, new factory in, in Japan. Um, China will, also has weaknesses, I think. If we're going to find out what they are, I don't think they can do everything. So what I think is, is, is we've got this, we have unleashed this, uh, the politicians have unleashed this incredible wave of competition. Everybody thinks it's, it's, it's compete or die. 
And as long as we don't get to a shooting war, it's going to lead to incredible advances in production, production efficiency and technology. Uh, I, I read this morning, uh, it, was a, it was an article some commentator said, is 5G a dud? You know, does anyone need 5G? And obviously the writer was totally unaware that there are 5G fact managed factories, you know, automated factories in China that use 5G for their internal operation control uh, that are so far advanced that the that U.S. will be likely to catch up, like port and harbor management and things like that. Uh, they don't even know what the technology is being used for. So you can say the U.S. is leading in technology, but then it depends on how narrow or wide your definition of technology is. Um, I suspect we're going to find out that in, on a 10-year view, the technology is going to become, uh, is going to advance to the point where the politicians will be forced to accommodate each other. Right, right, right. And it, it's not going to, China's not going to take over the world. Right. I mean, it's not even going to take over the U.S. The U.S. won't allow it. The Europeans won't allow it either. It's not going to happen. But then again, we're not going to take over China either. You know, Google and Facebook would love to get into China, but it's too late. Even if they let them in today, they would not wipe out the Chinese competition. The protectionism in China was to prevent that from happening, prevent you know, big American tech from getting the, the Chinese Google, Facebook type market and taking all their data. Well, it succeeded. Now, they could open it now. They probably won't, but they could. Uh, and there wouldn't be much uh, of a problem. Well, as, you know, Europe, by having allowed in these companies and now struggling, you basically, uh, <laughs> with trying to tax these companies or basically now you saw like, you know, yeah, they're yeah. just basically, uh, they're just hitting Google with another yeah, yeah. antitrust, basically, uh, you know, essentially lawsuit. Right. So I think from that point of view, I, I'm sure a lot of countries are regretting to some extent that basically that they had this complete free for all type of basically policy that encouraged the U.S. big tech companies to completely take over. I mean, Right. Yeah, yeah, and so we get like a like a 1984 situation, except it's economic, and and, and not entirely political, right? It's, you've got these three regions you know, c competing with and balancing each other. I mean, look what the Europeans are doing. I mean, it's very similar to what the Chinese are doing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so basically, so you think you know? So so I, no, I think I think I think you're exactly right. I, I think in some <laughs> sense that's the silver lining of this, you know, intensifying competition, right? Which is that, you know, what competition probably means faster pace of development, innovation, yeah. and basically, you know, ultimately, you know, technology at the end of the day is transferable. You know, whoever basically had developed the right technology or the better technology, that is going to become available to everybody eventually. I think so, so from that point of view, all, you, all we need I mean, from the point of view of the world's welfare, all we care about is the rate of innovation as opposed to who's going to basically develop it because ultimately everybody's going to benefit from it. And then therefore, intensifying competition probably means the whole world, you know, is going to be better off down the road. I think so. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I hope you're right. Yeah. But the question, of course, is that, you know, what a lot of the innovation, obviously what people are most concerned about is that innovation is going to become, you know, it's going to displace human beings. <laughs> Right. Maybe faster competition. I mean, basically faster innovation in technology just means that, you know, sooner basically people are going to become redundant. Are you worried about that at all? Maybe in Japan, people are less concerned about that because the population is shrinking. Yeah, it's shrinking in the U.S. too, <laughs> without, you know, massive immigration. Yeah. Um, yeah, creative destruction or destructive creation. You're right. Um, Japan uh, is in an enviable position because they can... Uh, their, their robot industry, their automation industry can run flat out with no concern over unemployment. It's, and then the Chinese have a unique system where they can run their automation development flat out and no one can do anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> the U.S. companies can almost guarantee to use AI to put people out of work. So they had better create some new jobs. Yeah. Or they're going to have some problems. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but oh, around here, I, I, I don't worry. I mean, Japanese do. They're very worried. And certain, certain areas in the economy are under great threat, like uh, illustrators and uh, purveyors of second-rate pop music who can be imitated by, by AI. Uh, they're already protesting. 
But the Japanese companies have already got ChatGPT under control. They're, they're bringing it all in-house, controlling it, using it internally, preventing information leaks, preventing like false information from getting in. Uh, so they've already come to grips with this. So maybe ChatGPT is going to be a bigger threat <laughs> than China, I think, for, you know. <laughs> to the U.S. Uh, to the U.S., <laughs> <laughs> to the world, you know. We'll find, out, we'll find that out very soon. Anyway, thank you very much, Scott. This was a fantastic conversation, and thanks for sharing your insight. Yeah, thank you. Yep. If you got something out of this video, please hit like and subscribe to my free YouTube channel. Let me know what you think by posting your comments in the video. If you want to learn more about my investment strategy, Come check us out at davidwuunbound.com. Thank you for listening.